Okay, now we look at our third part in our study on Egyptus and the origin of where Egypt comes from or the name given to it by the Greeks. Um, but here's a strange side story that you'd have and it goes with the religion of the Mormons. And this might show how some of the African Americans in America have gone to taking a belief in the fact that they are a portion of the Bible. Also, um, the fact that the Islamic slave trade started for about 900 years before the Americas were even found and that transatlantic slave trade had begun and those people justified their slavery at that time due to the same type of fact that I'm about to speak of. So, um, in later day saint theology, known as Mormon theology, Egyptus is the name of two women and not men, as shown before in the other stories of Egyptus. These are in the book of Abraham, in the Pearl of the Great Price, and this is a set of books that they have that were set up. It's the doctrines and covenants that they set up whenever um, the Mormons had come to America, and then what their beliefs and systems carried on uh, to this day, but it's kind of been quelled down quite a bit lately due to political correctness, but let's get into this. This is a, uh, one is the wife of Ham, the son of Noah, who bears his children. The other is the daughter who discovered Egypt while it was under water, supposedly. So probably under a great flood or an inundation, somewhere around that same time of year when they usually have it, which for them is not so springtime, but more Septemberish, which helps to float people in the area too quite a bit. It's amazing. Talked about it before. Anyhow, the younger Egyptus places her eldest son on the throne as the pharaoh and the first king of Egypt. So this would have put it as being Narmer or Menes, but uh, pharaoh, by the way, is actually just means big house. And uh, really, uh, it's the island where the uh, Alexandrian lighthouse was and stuff. And it wasn't really the name of the king so much, although he did live in a big house. Um, pharaoh was a descendant of the Canaanites. It shows here a race of people who had been cursed with black skin and this is from Moses 7 8 stuff but the belief that was done here is strange because Cain wasn't cursed with black skin and then also was well, supposed to be the wife of Ham and it's not Ham that got cursed but it was his son Canaan the fourth son down which is a strange curse that a, a drunk man made you know and uh, you know, he was with God in some great ways, but could a drunk man's naked curse do anything to anybody? And would it change the skin color? Well, they've never really approached to that. People have looked into it now and said there's no justification for any of that. Black people aren't in the Bible. India, Eskimos, none of those people are. But anyhow, Mormon leaders have taught that Egypt has passed back skin and the curse of Cain through the flood and that's how it made it through so that the devil might have a representation upon the earth and I you know there for a moment black people are like yeah look we're in the Bible Whoa, what yeah no that's what they say and they talk about how the Indians and all these people are just kind of primitives and so on and that they're supposed to come and bring like missionaries and do all this type of stuff and and the, the stories about how they met a Moroni, the angel, and the secret tablets that only he could read, and all this weird crap that goes on. But the man that did this, Joseph Smith, was like a, before this was a snake oil salesman, and running from county to county, running away from people that figured out he was a snake oil salesman. And eventually he ended up getting a hold of some Egyptian stuff, and off of misreading of the Book of the Dead of Ani itself, he ended up... Um, trying to come up with the idea of what all this meant and stuff and the man couldn't read hieroglyphics to save his life but that's what's told by the Mormons in their religion the word Egyptus is considered to be an anachronism in the book of Abraham uh, among non-Mormon Egypt Egyptologists and historians and so Egyptus and so you get this you, you get anachronism is a, is a way to float the word around and you get different letters uh, chrono, chrono, chronological inconsistency so you could Egyptus and you could put the E here you could put it there you could do it there and stuff and you could make 
different words out of it and the word jip can come out of it and you know stygian and no not quite you know i don't know anyhow since the origin of the term egypt is believed to have come from another source much later in history from the time of the narrative described in the book of abraham well no we just looked at what egypt's etymology comes out of in greeks and they had this story of egypt there too and so where does that original word come from well it, it's greek uh, it's not an egyptian word at all so um, they tell you here the word pharaoh is also considered to be an anachronism in the book of uh, abraham for similar reasons so they're saying that this is twist on words and things like that but pharaoh means big house and egypt meant enslaved people and so on and egypt wouldn't be called enslaved people they would have been the ones that supposedly in belief up until recent time we really figured out that really wasn't the case it was the locals that built everything caucasians but it's strange that they have that why would they have the name you know it'd be like well i name my name the enslavers that's not going to work but uh, the curse of cain concept w.w w. feltz a counselor in the presidency of the church was the first in the church to teach that ham's wife was black because she was under the curse of cain and i wonder how she could get under a curse only one person was cursed but boom and then the, the weird thing that comes out of that is that uh, if Canaanite was, uh, Cain himself was cursed to be black, who would he marry because everybody else was Caucasians here? So it would make a mulatto. If it made a mulatto, then how would it ever make primitive Negroids that are in the slave trade that are from Sub-Saharan Africa that nobody even knows exists at this time? And that's why it falls apart totally. But it's it was, an, it was a way to try to use use it to justify slavery in some way at this point you know 1835 we're looking at in 1835 he taught that ham himself was cursed because he had married a black wife so now not only is ham cursed for marrying a black wife but that would have made a mulatto and never made negroids but that has nothing to do with canaan and the curse of cain really would it but it's what they taught Brigham Young also taught that Egyptus was under the curse of Cain and passed the curse through the flood. And this is back whenever some people thought that the ancient Egyptians were Negroids because the males are drawn dark. But if you look at it, they're drawn not dark and not Negroid like the Nubians are, but very Caucasian. All the ancient ones they found now past this point here all have blue eyes and things like that to them. And there's so many stories about them not liking the black Negroids and the Nubians and stuff, and the Nubians are those darker people, and they do show them enslaving them and saying things like they're not even allowed into Egypt with boundary steles, like the Semna Stele of Sinshur at the third, and there's a bunch of others, but I, I like mentioning that one. It's one that's straightforward, and you usually can find a reference to. Some of the others are somewhat hidden now due to it being of a sensitive nature. But, uh, John Taylor explained that it was necessary that the curse of Cain was passed through Egyptus so that the devil should have a representation upon the earth as well as God. So this is telling you all the dark-skinned people were representations of the devil, right? Now, like many Americans, some Mormons of the 19th century accepted the idea promoted in slavery states that black Africans had Cain's mark of black skin and Ham's curse to be servants of servants. These ideas were eventually abandoned by later church leaders as unsupported by scripture in any way, shape, or form. People have looked into this. In fact, people to this day still try to say blacks are dead to the Bible from that way. Amazingly, in America now, we have them standing on street corners wearing clown suits saying that they're actually the Hebrews of the Bible. It was all about them, and it didn't have anything to do with white people whatsoever, Caucasians or anything. Isn't that amazing? Not really. They try to say they're everybody now, Greeks included and everything. So what's weird about this is back during this time, there was a lot of what we would call racism now because advanced Caucasian people were running into more primitive people around, and you can see how maybe... The ancient Aryans had gone in and helped India out. They're a darker skinned people and stuff and helped them get their crap together. Britain had to do it again later and stuff off of it. And they could see this Aryan contact that's with them, although a lot of them somewhat deny it. It had happened with proto Indo Europeans all the way up into China and stuff, but they're not dark skinned people. 
but any islanders we ran into and stuff were really primitive and stuff too. I mean, even Hawaii itself, Samoans, all of the Polynesians and stuff, real primitive type people, darker skins and so on like that. Really a Denisovan blend is what they had on them uh, from ancient times and so on. But And so does southern India. Aboriginals of Australia we knew about at this point here too. And so it's basically looking like, well, the Caucasians that God set upon the earth had set forth to build and create humanity and get it all going and I I think that's what we're looking at today uh, they can fly now and I heard they went to the moon and back so and they create a lot of the things like what I'm talking to you on now so it's seen that that really carries in and of course now that's looked as a totally racist view we're all totally equal and stuff well it it, it wasn't that way just shortly ago and we're all pretty aware of that and then if we go back in time it's really not that way at all and so when we look at it it does seem to follow that concept but is the Bible all a hundred percent thousand true and all that type thing we're not getting into that today what we are getting into is that the Mormons believe something that's not scripturally bound in any way or supported in any way and it's uh, looked at today as being quite racist they uh, also use the same doctrine to try to uh, have a hierarchy over the American Indians who had darker skin than them so there you go I mean they're primitives they're savages right and so we have that type of concept going on where uh, but but thankfully at least their concept is is that we're supposed to help these savages and bring them about so they still feel like their edict from way back when shh, is still going on great because you know, black people are starting to you know finally catch in somewhat and stuff it's taking quite some time because they were primitives whenever caught and stuff and a much lever lesser state, a really not even through and good into the Stone Age, if you want to be honest about it. But let's just go on and let's show some more connections here a little bit. The Babylonian name for Egypt was written in syllabic cuneiform as Hekoptah. So this has to do with Ptah. And it's strange what that word is, Hiccup. And we still use that today, and it's a sign of growth and growing. And they tell you, oh, yeah, you're growing, you're having growing pains, and so on like that when little kids have hiccups. And it does have to do with that slightly with the uh, the thing hooked up into your stomach where it'll help you have hiccups a little bit more and things, but I think that's a, a strange form. Also, Ptah is looked at as being a creator god, too, uh, of the Egyptians. And uh, there was a belief that uh, spit at one time in clay, mushed around and made man and so on off of it, using his own essence in the spit. And if you go into a lot of stories with, uh, you know, uh, clay building gods and you have that with Sumerians and so on and everything and even God himself in the Bible and he took the afar the dust of the earth uh, and you know spit into it and made it into whatever it was cabal then he made a woman out of a rib because uh, a, a woman grew from a rib and ate from a magic tree because of the talking snake told her to that's how that breaks down but um, so Hekopata was taken from an Egyptian name for Memphis, and so the area down there at the Gulf. The old capital of Egypt was Hokket Pata, or the house of the spirit of Pata, <coughs> i.e., a temple of Pata. Of course, what we think of as temples today is not really that, but if you think of ancient temples, maybe you get more of an idea paganistic in your mind somehow, but hey, everything is, it's just whichever one you're with, you don't call it that. Anyhow, which by extension became the name of Egypt or Egyptus or Egyptus, Coptics called it Ekepta. So in Homer, it's both listed as the Nile River and the country. So they called the Nile the Egyptus and the river that. But no, it's the Nilus, and we just talked about it in the other deals. That was an ancient river god that they had had from way back when, which uh, I guess is also called Happy, uh, of the more southern Egyptians here. And... So you see a nod connection that goes with that also. Um, also uh, in Biblioteca, as the Eponidius son of Belus and Arsino, or Arkinoi, who also first conquers Egypt. So um, we just talked about that too and how Bel works with Baal and how he was one of the first people to conquer Egypt. So apparently he's what it helped set it off. And is this your Narmer type person they're talking about? Well, no, because then you would have to say Baal is somebody that's from Sumerian because the Sumerians helped kick it off. That was the influx of the followers of Horus. So 
there must have been more than one influx, more than one time to happen, or people wouldn't have mythologies that contrast each other slightly. But if you overlap them, they make a lot more sense. How you get a one, two, three situation going on when the blending happens. Hint, 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 hint. This also, he says, this variant name could apply well reflect the Egyptian name of Seth Ptah, or daughter of Ptah, but in that the T is silent, which is not known, so that's Set, and uh, which is not known from the Middle Kingdom to the Late Period, which is known from the Middle Kingdom to the Late Period. And of course, here we had Seth from the Bible, the Sethites, Seti, and uh, they're known to be redheads, the uh, necropolis out there uh, that they're excavating even to this day that has millions of bodies in it and stuff. They seem to be separated in blondes here, redheads here, and dark red people in the other area, and then Seti and stuff. It seems to be like if the ruler was going to go that, then they, that's what his sacred name would be, because they weren't named with these exact names. It's also one of the reasons that the lineages don't work exactly, because if your kid ain't a redhead, then he isn't necessarily going to be a Sethite again. He's going to be followed under Horus or one of the others. Horus is, of course, known as a blue-eyed type of god. Maybe more blondes go with him, if you will. I don't know. Um, so we also find uh, that that's the daughters of Ptah and moreover this recalls the synchronetic mythology and late Egyptian hieratic story of Astarte in the sea now Astarte we found is Ishtara and Inanna, Diana and so on of the sea so this is kind of like you know hey that, that depiction you see of the coming up out of the sea and the seashell and so on it seems wherein the Semitic Astarte is also called the daughter of Ptah. She is therefore the equivalent of Hathor. Hathor really is pretty much Hath, house of Horus, if you will, hat of Hor. And so that's the sky. And so things are symbolic here. That You can see there's a lot of that going on. And who's what in the sky, and the sky is under the clouds, the clouds under them you know the heaven and so on and then what is the night and what is the day and things like that it's very archaic but uh, to us to we look at today but for that time is extremely advanced and quite in depth and that in depth of things gave people all these variations of things to go off of which probably expounded their mind quite a bit over and above all the things that went with it anyhow so this house of Horus this Hathor who was also the daughter of Ptah, and who was in the same constellation as Virgo, and which meant the first month of the inundation season on the Palermo stone. Sorry, each king is accompanied by his mother's name and by the measured height of the inundation in September, which is the the flood. For after all, when this woman discovered the land, it was under water. They say. Moreover, Hathor is the eye and the mother of Re. Ra and the first king of Egypt in the book of the divine cow the mother of the king of upper and lower Egypt here itself it says of the living king was addressed as God's daughter set nader namely the daughter of Ptah and is the apparent case here with Zeptah Egyptus who is both mother of the king of Egypt and the granddaughter of Noah this is significant since Ptah is paralleled for Noah in that, as for the blacksmith of the gods, the thieves, Hephaestus, are known as Vulcan, he is equivalent of the Phoenician craftsman god Kosor, which in Ugaritic, Kater or Kathar or Kathar ha Kasis, is the very skillful and intelligent one in Egyptian. So this works together much more than anybody would ever think which is the same character as the Sumero-Akkadian Noah's Utnapishtim. In the Gilgamesh epic, in the Atrahasis, Zeosudra is also known Kosor Ptah at Ugarit. And the ancient Ugarit will show you of the Canaanite gods. And I've got a series coming up I've been holding off on where it's talking about um, when Jacob and Esau get back together at the river and then the things that come from out of that and actually it pinpoints the fact that the Bible does come from all Canaanite religions the god El and not his daughter which is Anatolia Baal and the Baal worship and everything that comes from around there 
and how that in Ugarit it kind of pinpointed who Yahweh and his Asherah were. Yep, Yahweh has a wife. His name, her name was Asherah. Asherah is Astera. Astera is Astara, and Astara is Astarte. And now we have that same divine thing, which even in this depiction here is the Sumerian version of it here. Right? Ishtar. All the way through the Bronze Age and way back before as in Nana, she would have been the daughter of the Queen of Heaven herself. Yep. Interesting though, guys, but uh, you look here and uh, let's see, here's all the sources from it and stuff. And out of the realm of superstition, the curse of Ham, where we have a uh, young speech on slavery, blacks, and the priesthood in the latter days and stuff. And so how, what their thoughts were. Egypt and the pharaohs. Um, doom, 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 doom. Summer, fall, Egypt. The Astarte Papyrus. We'll have to go into that one there. Yahweh and the gods of Canaan. Citing the Book of the Dead. Yep. Yeah. So, the reference is here. Yahweh and the gods of Canaan. A historical analysis of two contrasting faiths. Well, one was just monotheistic and saying it was all one after the fact. The Book of the Dead, Papyrus of Ani, Late Egyptian Stories, the Astarte Papyrus itself, Egypt and the Pharaohs, two religious borrowings in Ugaritic literature, the Egyptian god Bata in Ugaritic mythology. Oh, yeah. Yep, he's in that. You know, what? So look at the blending. Whenever I tell you that the Greeks used to have a lot of other people's gods, of not just their area, but all the whole entire area, the same can be said about a lot of Egyptian gods for uh, Horus himself and Shemsu Hor comes from Proto-Indo-Europeans and the Sumerians where they show that same falcon god doing the thing of fertilizing the tree of life it's actually there um, I guess one other way to show you that the uh, Hamites didn't really ever have anything to do with Negroes is just to put in Hamites and uh, see what it says. Hamites, from the biblical Ham, is a historical term in the 19th and 20th century etnology linguistics for a division of the Caucasian race and the group of related ling languages that these populations spoke. The appellation Hamitic was applied to the Berber, Cushitic, and Egyptian branches of the Afroatic language camp. So the Berbers of North Africa, the Cushites that everybody talks about and tries to say they're black, and the Egyptian branches. Uh, language family, which together with the Semitic branch was thus formally labeled Hamo Semitic together. However, these three branches have not been shown to form exclusive monophyletic unity, and so they've broken them out and just call them Afroasiatics and stuff. But um, so, in the beginning of the 19th century, scholars generally agreed the Hamitic race was a subgroup of Caucasians along with Semitics. And so, you, you know, this is supposed to be the three people come out of the Bible, and they knew who the Jephethites were for sure. They were the Greeks and so on, and the people that were doing all these studies. Thus, the grouping of the non Semitic populations of North Africa and the Horn of Africa, always endemic Caucasians, and the ancient Egyptians. So, according to the Hamatic theory, Hamatic race was superior to or more advanced than the Negroid populations of Sub Saharan Africa in its most extreme forms in the writing of Seligun. This theory asserted that virtually all significant achievements in African history were the works of Hamites or Caucasians who had migrated into Central Africa as pastoralists, beginning new customs, language, technologies, administrative skills with them, and then as the Sahara dried up, turned into what they were. In the early 20th century, theoretical models of Hamitic languages and Hamitic races were intertwined. This nomenclature gradually fell out of favor between the 1960s and the 1980s. I wonder why. In a large part due to its perceived association with colonial paternalism, the population of Hamitic ancestral stock are now commonly just known as Caucasoid. And so when we see that the Hamites were Afroasiatic Berber Kushites and Egyptians, the Egyptians are Caucasian, well noted at that time. They, now they talk about the concept of the curse of Ham here. If you want to look up Hamites, you can and it'll show you. But it's supposed to be that he, caught, he put a curse on his youngest son, Canaan. And they say that they would be the servant of servants. And sent people back then were capturing and doing each other with slavery with no Negroes involved whatsoever. But later, people started doing Negro slavery. They said, well, that must be what it is. 
they are going to be the servants of you because you're our servants. We captured you, but then they'll be your servants. So you can see this serfdom of concept that they tried to bring into it, and they tell you right here, and that uh, some Arab slave trader used the account of Noah and Ham in the Bible to illegally justify Negro or Zanj slavery, which I just did a video on Zanj. If you want Z say Z-A-N-J, type it in, go into my channel and look it up, and, and it'll tell you about what these people said, and these Arabs. Anyhow, and later European and American Christian traders and slave owners adopted a similar argument. However, the Bible in itself indicates that Noah restricted this curse to the offspring of Ham's only youngest son, Canaan, so it doesn't have to do with Hamites at all. Those descendants occupied the Levant, and it was not extended to Ham's other sons, who had migrated into Africa. According to Sanders, 18th century theologians increasingly emphasized this narrow restriction and accurate interpretation of the passage as applying to Canaan's offspring they rejected the curse of justification for slavery and that blacks didn't have anything to do with it or the Bible, but people were using it. Anyhow, and so you look at ancient Egyptians' pictures and stuff, and even some of their heads and sculptures, and that's a Caucasian. You can find black people with a lot of admix that look like this now. That's not a Negroid. And I don't need to go into the thousands of Egyptian pictures that actually show you this type of thing, but what are these Berbers and what are these Guanches and stuff look like? extremely Caucasian. There's huge remnants of them to this day that are there. You look at the uh, Amazi people, you can see blonde and red heads and so on, and it uh, makes quite a bit of a difference and so on. But uh, yeah, so a lot has been tried to make out of that, to try to make it to where the Bible has everybody in it, as opposed to just talking about the Caucasians that it clearly talks about coming out of a boat, which apparently landed in the Caucasus Mountains and spread out and became three forms of humanity. Well, the three forms of humanity were all three Caucasians. For the ancient Persian Aryans and so on, and Proto-Indo-Europeans were Caucasians. So were they all through the Levant and into Egypt, all of North Africa, and yet so were all the Northern Europeans and Japhethites. And they're all closely related and totally tied in together. What's not tied into it is Negroids, people from Southern India, people from Asia, Amerindians, Eskimos, things along that like. But anybody can adopt a religion, but you can't turn around and say that it's yours when it's a lie. Caucasian race. Caucasians here. Where did they used to be? Well, it's Caucasian or Europeoid. Where they used to be? Well, uh, they used to be the ancient and modern populations of Europe, Western Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, North Africa, and the Horn of Africa. So when we talk about people being up where Ethiopia is talked about and the Ethiopians and so on, it isn't necessarily talking about um, Negroids because they weren't really there at the time. Let's see if I can type correctly here. Transpose my I and O and I'll really get it messed up. Um, so if we looked at like Ethiopians, right, um, there can be a lot of things said. They'll show you the current plays. They'll show you Ethiopian languages and so on. Um, Ethiopia, though, in the Greek term itself, meant something totally different. Um, let's see if we can find where that's at. Gonna have to cut this all out now. Put that down. The hell I can't type. I put a T in front of it. So again, if we just look up Ethiopia from the people who made up the word. 
that we all try to rely on to this day that somehow people are thinking, oh, it must have been those people from that country that's starving to death up there. No, it wasn't in ancient times. In ancient times, ancient Greece, Ethiopia, um, it's talked about in a lot of places in the Odyssey and all their stories. And really, this is what they called Ethiopia here, any place that's brown. And so, yeah, well, they thought, first of all, the Nile came up and turned and went around and came from the Atlas Mountains, and that's Atlantis is right near there that they show you in some of his maps they talk about. But they're saying, yeah, over here, over here, really farming communities, almost anywhere that they go through. And uh, what's not shown on here is that usually on this map, it'll show you these are the Eastern Ethiopians listed right down here. But then they talk about Ethiopians being up here and so on. And none of these people are a Negroid or a Caucasian Negroid blend right now. That's about 40% Caucasian, by the way, of Ethiopians up here. It's why they look so different. The Ethiopians that are up here aren't the people that would have been around all over. No, 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 no. They can barely sustain themselves now, and they're an admixed people. That's not what was even in this Horn of Africa at the time. And the microbians that have long lives and so on and come from an ancient time that in elder times were come from a boat and came over here from this place too, which is the Tigris and Euphrates, where the Bible say that it all began. And amazingly, if we just go up the Tigris and Euphrates to the top of it, we end up running right up here into the Caucasus Mountains. And if you look, they're saying in Caucasus Mountains that people have that Ethiopia trait that they talk about two times in their stuff too. What? Yeah, Caucasians can get tanned too. It's sunburnt face. That's what Ethiopia means. It never meant a Negroid. Now we've twisted that around again to try to justify certain things. Anyhow, guys, like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy. And uh, that's another third look, I guess, at where the word Egyptus comes from. And uh, this one would have been a strange, newer form of it, taken out of context by much later people trying to justify slavery. Peace.